the power of pride. No matter what their role in the Christian community, leaders must be on guard against the human and often subtle tendency to be prideful and even arrogant. Here now is Gene Getz. In this particular section of uh, Jeremiah, we see the power of pride. It's an incredible illustration. Here's what we read. We have God's promise of protection to the remnant, those who stayed, those who were not taken into captivity, those who lived outside of Jerusalem. There were many people that still were there after Nebuchadnezzar came in, and they burned the city of Jerusalem and took a number into captivity. And so they came to uh, Jeremiah, who, by the way, was released, remember? The chains were taken off. He was actually chained that the chains came off, and the captain of the guard, Babylonian leader, said, you're free. So Jeremiah is free. He's there. But he, he stayed in that area. Obviously, he lived in that area. His family lived in that area. And notice, they said, should we go down to Egypt? They came and they asked, shall we go down to Egypt? Now, one of the reasons they asked is they were starving. They were not able to take care of themselves. Things were in a shambles. They were fearful. And that's understandable. But notice what Jeremiah said after he went to the Lord. Chapter 42, he said to them, this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel to whom you sent me to bring your petition before Him, if you will indeed stay in this land then I will rebuild and not demolish you, and I will plant and not uproot you, because I relent concerning the disaster that I have brought on you. Don't be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Don't be afraid of him. This is the Lord's declaration, because I am with you to save you and deliver you from him. In other words, that group that was left behind in their desperate situation, were tempted to leave the land and go down to Egypt. By the way, that sounds like some of the other biblical stories in the New Testament, leaving the land and going down to Egypt. Abraham did that, by the way, in the Old Testament as well, as an escape. And it was a mistake, evidently, because he got in all kinds of trouble, because he didn't stay in the land and trust God in the midst of that famine. But here you have another illustration of this. And God says, no, stay there. I will take care of you. I'm no longer wrathful because of the evil that happened here. I'm relenting. I want to have compassion on you. Unfortunately, these leaders didn't listen. After all that Jeremiah had said, after all the things he had prophesied, after all these things came true, notice their response. When Jeremiah had finished speaking to all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, all these words the Lord their God had sent him to give them, then Azariah, son of Hoshiah, Johanan, son of Kariah, and all the other arrogant men, that's a powerful statement. All the other arrogant men responded to Jeremiah. You're speaking a lie. I mean, they're talking to a man who went to prison because he told the truth. They're talking to a prophet who went into a pit of mud because he told the truth. And they're accusing him of telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say, you must not go down to Egypt to live there for a while. Rather, Baruch, son of Neriah, is inciting you. Baruch, son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to hand us over to the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to put us to death or to deport us to Babylon. And of course, the key phrase in this whole paragraph is arrogant men. What happened? They went down to Egypt, and they all died. They were slaughtered. The 
because they didn't follow the will of God. They didn't obey. They didn't respond. They rejected the words from Jeremiah. As I thought about this, I thought, you know, we have illustrations of pride throughout history. In fact, when I think of, uh, of the rulers of this world, I can't think of many who haven't operated out of arrogance. I think of the king of Babylon. I think of Nebuchadnezzar. I think about the 90-foot huge monument he built to himself. And I think about the fact that he ordered that if you didn't bow down to that monument, you're going to die. And that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do it, and they went into the fire furnace. There was a line they couldn't cross in Babylon. But what, what drove this man? It was arrogance. It was arrogance. I think of uh, Saddam Hussein. And if you went to Babylon, not too long before he was deposed, I don't know what it's like today, but there was a huge, huge uh, picture of Nebuchadnezzar where Saddam Hussein was rebuilding the city of Babylon in southern Iraq. And to the right of the huge gate going into this complex was a picture of Saddam Hussein. I've seen that, those pictures. Saddam Hussein was going to become the Nebuchadnezzar of the world today. That was his goal. As you look about at the leaders of the world, what drives them? The power of pride, arrogance, so many times. We have an illustration of uh, arrogance in a church in the New Testament. Uh, John, the apostle, wrote a, a little letter. It's called Third John, just one chapter. And this is what he said, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have first place among them. Now, folks, this is a leader in the church who loves to have first place among them, does not receive us. And John was an apostle. This is why if I come, I remind him of the works he's doing, slandering us with malicious words, attacking the apostle John, who after all these years in his 90s has been this faithful servant. He says, and he is not satisfied with that. He not only refuses to welcome the brothers himself, but even stops those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Diotrephes. What was the basis of his actions? Pride. I remember I went through a terrible situation as a pastor on one occasion where a group of individuals rose up against me. Found out later it was really a, a plot because I was getting too close to their sin in that particular situation. And I remember a man who came to me in that midst of that situation. He's now with Jesus, and he said, Gene, there is a diatrophies in this church. And later, we discovered who that diatrophies was, who basically had orchestrated a lot of what took place, the evil that took place. For what purpose? What was the motivation? Arrogance. Pride. We have uh, an illustration of a man who was humble in the same church. His name was Demetrius. And John wrote about him, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we also testify for him. And you know that our testimony is true. Wow, what a statement about a godly man. There are people in this world who follow Diotrephes. And here 
John is speaking particularly to those of us who are leaders. But then he gives us this beautiful illustration of Demetrius, a man of God, a man of humility, a man who followed the example of Jesus Christ, where Paul wrote that we are to follow him. Jesus is our example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus, who though he was, he existed in this world, uh, though he existed in the form of God, did not cling to that position, but he laid aside, humbled himself, became a man, and even went to the cross. Imitate Jesus Christ. So here's the question for reflection and response. Why are pride and arrogance often the core issues that cause even spiritual leaders to make disastrous decisions that are so destructive to the cause of Christ? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to go to the Apostle John, once again, who gave us some very wise words that came directly from the Holy Spirit. And it's something that we all need to be aware of, even as believers. John wrote, Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world... Now, here's the answer, really, I think, to the question. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does God's will remains forever. Let's remember this principle to live by. No matter what their role in the Christian community, leaders must be on guard against the human and often subtle tendency to be prideful and even arrogant.